Music and birdsong do not usually sound very similar. Nevertheless, they are behaviors that have a lot in common. First of all, both music and birdsong are sequences of structured sounds organized in time. That means they're both very rhythmic behaviors. Both are skills that need to be socially learned and they're both being performed. That means they are being presented in the context of a performance for conspecifics to listen to. Finally, they are both designed structurally to affect mood and behavior in their listeners. So we are interested in understanding what the rhythms of sound sequences with these functions and roles might look like. Of course, we know that musical rhythms are extremely diverse. So if we want to find out how musical rhythms are structured, we have to look at them across human cultures. Any single musical culture will not give us a comprehensive picture there. But what we did in this study was going even beyond that. We extended that question of how rhythms can be structured to an alien species, a songbird species. And we asked what their rhythms may have in common with ours. This was motivated by the many functional and behavioral similarities of the two behaviors that made us think that perhaps there are similar constraints that have shaped their rhythms in similar ways. To investigate this, we chose a specific songbird, the thrush nightingale, which sounds extremely rhythmic. To compare between musical and bird rhythms, we went for the most basic rhythm unit, which is just a pair of two note onset to onset time intervals. Between any two notes, two note onsets, there's one interval. So to have a pair of intervals, we need three note onsets. And what we do in our analysis is like taking a little magnifying glass, an imaginary magnifying glass that only sees two intervals at a time. And we take this magnifying glass and slide it along the musical sequence. I'll give you an example. So the first interval pair in this musical sequence would be this. It comprises three notes, so two intervals. And we have one long interval in there and one short one. The second two interval pair in the sequence would be this, which comprises one short interval and a medium one. And the third interval pair is this, which contains two similar intervals of medium length. Now, this is a very simple rhythm measure. Um, nevertheless, it's already suited to um, reflect that musical rhythms are usually categorical. Out of all possible interval pairs, there's only a small subset that is used in a given piece of music. There are three broad categories of rhythm that we know are particularly important in music, probably across all cultures. The first one is isochrony. In isochrony, in each pair of, um, of intervals, the first one has exactly the same length as the second one. So in this sequence, when you slide your magnifying glass along, every pair of intervals has two intervals of the same size. Interestingly, in the Thrush Nightingale song, we found a lot of examples of such rhythms. The second important category are alternating rhythms. Um, in alternating rhythms, in every pair of intervals, you have one short and one longer interval. And again, in the Thrush Nightingale song, we found many examples of this. A third important category in musical rhythm is ornamentation. Um, in that case, in a pair of intervals, we have one very short interval that is as short as possible, and the second one can be any length, it's much longer. And for that, we find many examples in the Thrush Nightingale song too. To see how typical these examples are for, for um, Thrush Nightingale song in general, we have developed a visualization that can visualize two interval rhythms of uh, long performances or even big corpora in their entirety. 
What we do there is again we slide our magnifying glass for two intervals along the sound sequence and as we go for each pair of intervals we plot the shorter interval to the left of our plot and the longer interval to the right. The y-axis is not to scale, we just sort all pairs of intervals according to their overall duration. So the slow ones are at the top and the fast ones are at the bottom. The raster plot looks a bit like a flower, with a narrow stem, fanning out petals and a transition point in between. The rhythms that are slower than the transition point are flexible and variegated. And we can recognize the three broad rhythm categories, the ornament-like rhythms, the isochronous rhythms and the alternating rhythms in between. In contrast, the rhythms that are faster than the transition point are much less flexible. There is basically just one mode at each tempo here, something that's close to isochrony. We were able to compare the bird rhythms to a large range of musical rhythms from different cultures. And this was mainly thanks to um, an amazing corpus, the Interpersonal Entrainment in Music Performance Corpus, that has been put together by a group of um, musicologists and ethnomusicologists and compares a large range of musical styles, including North Indian Raga, Cuban salsa and son, and um, Malian djembe drumming that was recorded by a colleague of ours here from the Institute, Rainer Pollack. Here you see the same raster plots for six musical corpora and the birds side by side. The first thing we noticed was that the raster plots of the music performances also all resemble flowers with this narrow stem and the fanning out petals. So that means at the slower tempos, um, they all had a great rhythm flexibility with many different categories um, they could produce at the same tempo, whereas underneath the transition point with faster rhythms, there was much less flexibility and um, largely just one mode they can use at these fast tempos. A notable difference to the birds is that the musician flowers are much broader, particularly in the stems. The birds' transition point is at a much faster tempo. This points to an extraordinary motor proficiency of the birds. They can sing extremely fast. Taken together, our results have revealed some very basic similarities between birdsong rhythm and human rhythms. The main similarity is that both are categorical and the broadest categories are largely overlapping between the species. Now we can ask, why is that so? Why do birds, just like human musicians, produce categorical rhythm? One possible explanation might be that both are culturally transmitted, both birdsong and music, and it's possible that just by virtue of this transmission process, um, rhythm categories will emerge just because it's easier to transmit categories than a continuum of phenomena. This is more of, an, um, of a mechanistic explanation in a way. Alternatively, or perhaps in addition, those rhythm categories could also be related to expressiveness. It's possible, at least, that birds do just what musicians do and combine these rhythm categories in ways that are expressive and interesting for their listeners to hear.